from the Mercy One Studio. Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulis every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting today from the Mercy One studio, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. Around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I will be joined by Monsignor James Shea from the University of Mary, who recently published a book uh, entitled From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. Excited to have him on the show today. Let's start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. First off, big thanks to all the men who joined us this weekend on Saturday morning at the Iowa Catholic Men's Conference. Felt so good to be in a room full of men worshiping the Lord, learning, growing together, especially just after this last year, right, with COVID, um, with all the social distancing, to be back together uh, in worship and be back together uh, growing together as men. And obviously with the speakers of Tim Jamison and, and Gary Dolphin, just a really great event and excited that we were able to pull it off in fairly short order, um, given the just how everything was kind of opening up pretty quickly here. So thanks for all everyone who joined us. Looking forward to doing it again next year. As I mentioned, my guest today, Monsignor James Shea, the book From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, I first heard about it from Father John Ricardo. He was raving about it about six months ago, saying it was the best book he's read in a long time. And then actually Tim Jamison, just, I was at his house one time, and he threw, threw the book at me. He said, you got to read this book. And I agree with both of them. It is a must read. So we're going to head to a short break. And when we return, I will have on Monsignor James Shea. Stick around, and we will be right back. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio, John Leonetti in the Morning, and the Maroon Moment is provided by Golden Rule Heating and Cooling. Since 1999, Golden Rule Heating and Cooling has been supporting customers with their rules to live by. Respect, understanding, loyalty, expertise, and service. Golden Rule Heating and Cooling is a family-run business, reminding you of the Golden Rule. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Golden Rule Heating and Cooling. GoldenRulePHC.com. Thank you, Golden Rule Heating and Cooling, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Hi, this is Father John Ricardo, and I want to thank Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory for underwriting Christ is the Answer. Losing a loved one, as we know, is never easy, and it can leave you feeling lost and even hopeless at times. But Caldwell Parish helps ease that burden by sincerely caring both about your loss and about your faith. Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory is Des Moines' only Catholic-owned and operated funeral home. Their number is 515-276-0551 or online at caldwellparish.com. My help comes from you. You're right here and welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I'm so excited today to have my guest, Monsignor James Shea. He was inaugurated in 2009 as the sixth president of Mary University and at age 34 became the youngest college or university president in the United States. By the way, beating out Ben Sass, who was 37, so he beat him by three years. He began his undergraduate work at Jamestown College, majoring in English and history, and then entered seminary at the Diocese of Bismarck, earning a bachelor's degree in a pontifical master's degree in philosophy at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He studied classical Greek at the University of Texas at Austin and continued at the Vatican College in North America, North American College, studying theology in Gregorian and Lateran universities in Rome. He has studied at the University of Management at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business and is an alumni of the Institutes for Higher Education at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. 
Monsignor Nerche is a knight commander for the of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and serves as the board of directors of Focus, one of my favorite organizations, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Monsignor Nerche, unfortunately, your bio was so long, we've run out of time to talk about the reason you're here. Thank you for joining me. Well, give me, yeah, give me just a second. I've got to put down my shaver. I've been shaving while you, I had to shave twice while you read my bio. If you wouldn't go so to so many colleges and get so many degrees, this wouldn't be a problem. And Monsignor, thank you so much for joining me today uh, to talk about your book, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Uh, anyone who has heard me in the last month and a half has gotten an earful on it. Uh, it's been It's been one of the best books I've ever read. So first off, thank you and your team for writing it. I'm really grateful and honored to be able to be with you today in this way and talk about the book. And it's it's humbling for us because uh, this is the th- this is something which we put out. The University of Mary Press published this book primarily as an internal document. It's a it's the result of a group of good friends who have been talking for a long time about the changing dynamics that we see in the church and in the world and how we best as disciples of Jesus can meet that challenge. Uh, And so it's something which has been sort of an incubation for a long, long time. And, um, and, And we wrote it because we're following that blueprint here at the University of Mary in North Dakota in in the service of our students and the work that we do on behalf of Christ and his church. And so it's tremendously, um, uh, edifying really that, that the book has found such, um, such resonance beyond the University of Mary and beyond the small circle of people who were first talking about it. You know, I, I see that in the preface where, you know, I don't see your name. It says, you know, the University of Mary, and then you write the preface and say, hey, this is a group of us writing this. And then you go quickly right into, first of all, I love the, the fact that you, just the whole way you put it into context of you actually being in Jerusalem uh, talking about the early Christians. But then you, you quote Archbishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. You say, we are at the end of of Christendom, not of Christianity, not of the church, but of Christendom. And that kind of sets the framework for the book. Can you talk about the framework of the book uh, to our listeners who might not be, maybe have, maybe not have read or heard of it? Yeah, the Venerable Fulton Sheen did say that way back in the mid-1970s, and he was making an observation which was picked up then later by Pope Francis. Now, Pope Francis wasn't directly influenced by Fulton Sheen, but they had the same idea Pope Francis was one of the drafters of the Aparacita document of the Latin American bishops when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And then when he became Pope, he's quoted this this document, which he had a part in writing many times, where he says, everybody says that we're at a change of, uh, that we're at an age of change, that this is an age of change in which we live. And he said, that's not quite right. It's not an age of change. It's a change of age. It's a change of the ages. Sometimes in human history, Certain things happen, societal seismic shifts, which really change everything and which deeply affect the way that people live and the way that people's imaginations, hearts and minds are formed and shaped and then are able to respond to the gospel. And so this is a shift which has been happening over the course of the last few centuries, but which is really accelerated in our own time. And it has to do with what all of us as, as faithful Catholics are pretty concerned about. It's the, it's the phenomenon of secularization. It's the movement from a, from a Christian mindset in society to a very secular one. And when, when something this mighty shifts beneath our feet, if we don't shift and move with it, if we don't meet the challenge of our times with the freshness of the gospel, then our message grows stale and we begin to lose. We begin to lose the battle for hearts and minds. And so the idea behind the book is to say, okay, Christendom is past. We've seen it die. Um, the the idea that, 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 that the teachings of the church and the teachings of the gospel deeply influence and shape um, uh, the world in which we live, that's not exactly the case anymore. But that doesn't mean that the gospel is irrelevant. It's more relevant than ever before. And in the apostolic time, which is not new to the Church, because the early centuries of the Church, the Church had an apostolic mode. We need to now readopt an apostolic mode in a different way for our own time. That's what the book's about. I think the reason it resonates so much, the reason it's exploded off the bookshelves uh, in ways that you guys couldn't have imagined— I think the reason that it's doing that is because you guys are naming it. I think we've all seen it, right? We've all seen it in our own lives. We've seen church attendance goes down. We've seen people leaving the church. We've seen it all happen anecdotally, but no one's ever named it so succinctly before until this book, in my mind. Uh, and so I think that's, to me, the power 
of this little, what is it, 90 some odd page book that the reason it's so powerful is because people are seeing you guys really nail, uh, put the hammer on the nail as far as the problem and then the solution. So I want to talk about the, the problem. When you you name it Christendom and you talk about these these ages of Christendom and apostolic mission and you use analogies like in my mind about the stream, about you know when you're in Christendom, everything kind of flows. Uh, so give us an idea of what it looked like in Christendom, how how that feels and then how it feels to not be in, a, in an era of Christendom. Sure. And the way that we frame it is we talk about how uh, Christendom has some advantages and disadvantages, and the apostolic age in which we're living now has advantages and disadvantages. In a Christendom time, the advantages, we don't have to talk too much about them, uh, because it's somewhat obvious. In other words, when the message of Christ suffuses a culture, captures the minds and hearts of an entire society, all kinds of good things happen. It's a good atmosphere, for instance, in, in terms of the building of institutions. So you see the flourishing of, of uh, universities, for instance, and Catholic schools and Catholic hospitals and apostolic works and, and charitable works of all kinds. Uh, it's a good uh, age in which to raise a family because parents aren't doing it all by themselves. The, uh, the society all around them helps in that because uh, Christian values and the Christian mindset are everywhere. And the, and, and the, the fruits of Christ's presence, the sweetness of, of his life, touches every aspect of human life. Uh, there are temptations in a time of Christendom as well. People can grow lukewarm. There can be a lot of corruption because, uh, for instance, to, to be a churchman uh, can have certain benefits uh, which cause corrupt people or, or people with mixed intentions to pursue life with the church or life in the church. And the biggest sin in a time of Christendom is hypocrisy, which is and this, this uh, I think, is, is directly related to the man up <laughs> section, to the, to the uh, deep mission of, of your great radio program. Uh, men have to be aware all the time of, of the besetting temptations in which they, with which they're faced. And in the Christendom age, there's a great temptation to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the great sin. That's pretending to be more concerned about Christ and the truth and the church and the gospel than one really is. An apostolic time, of course, is different uh, in that uh, in the the uh, um, advantages to it are that because there's a cost, because persecution is rife, because uh, one has to really stand up for one's faith, uh, one isn't is easily understood. The cultural uh, winds aren't blowing in your direction, but are blowing really against you. As a result, um, the faith tends to attract the most high-hearted. Um, the, the faith tends to have a purity about it that it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, the, uh, those who really set out to live the gospel don't live it in a kind of haphazard way. Uh, they don't live it uh, sort of on autopilot, but you have to be really intentional. And that means that the high-hearted adventure of the gospel comes through more clearly. Of course, there's a bitter price to pay as well. Um, it's, it's harder to build institutions. Uh, we, we say in the book that uh, building an institutions in an apostolic time is like trying to construct a house in a gale wind. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's how we feel, those of us who are entrusted with institutions like universities, in my case, or uh, schools or those kinds of things, charitable organizations. Uh, there, there are um, uh, barriers of all kinds. And it's hard to raise a family because you don't have that support. And so raising children in, a, in an apostolic time and making sure that they, um, that they have uh, access to the beauty of the faith and that they internalize it, that's harder. And then the besetting sin of an apostolic time is not hypocrisy like it is in a time of Christendom. It's cowardice, not pretending to care more about the faith than you really do, but actually pretending to care less about it than you actually do, which robs the gospel of its power. And so we have to watch out for cowardice in our time. But that's sort of, that's sort of the, um, the, the photographic negative yeah. that we paint. Yeah, and so that's kind of that's how it sets the stage. And I think, again, it kind of brings light to these things. So we talk about the church uh, in an era of Christendom is, is playing defense, right? So think of it from a business, you know, they've gotten to, they're like GE, right? They've taken it all, and now it's just a matter of we've got to continue to do what we're doing. They're not out trying to be the trendsetter. They're not trying to be uh, the one going out and, and firing the fields and getting people fired up. 
Uh, and so that manifests itself in having bishops and priests who who are going to be more just kind of pastoral and keep everyone happy rather than the guy who's going to go out and trailblaze uh, and find new things. And that's the same thing. It percolates down to the laity as well. When you move on, I think we've all seen that, right? We've all seen that. And now we've moved on to what we're calling an apostolic mission phase. You look at, and I, I always use the example of the Des Moines Diocese, and Bishop Barron talks a lot about this specifically uh, in regards to the, the priest abuse scandal from the early thousands. Mm. You, you're not going to have priests giving their life up for the church who are lukewarm, right? This is not going to happen. Uh, you're, not, you're going into this w- with a martyr's mindset, knowing that the, all the prestige of, of wearing the collar that was once there, after the, the abuse scandal, there's no... Uh, you know, we're not pretending that's the case. Um, people are going in fully committed to the gospel. And I think that's now, again, as you mentioned just right there, that we as a laity, that's going to be our job. I mean, we're, we are now going to, to see this. And I'm curious on how this is going to manifest itself. So you, you kind of set the framework that we're moving into this new age, and this new age is going to have um, certain responsibilities. So how concretely, how, how will this concretely manifest itself in the lives of the laity specifically? Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe I'll come to that in just a second. It's interesting that you talked about the clergy sex abuse scandal, because I was ordained in 2002. So I became a priest in the year that the sex abuse scandal really ripped through uh, the United States from Boston all the way down to Dallas. And it was an interesting experience for me and for my classmates, Joe, because we really had to man up, so to speak. We really had, you know, we had uh, some of us, like myself, had been uh, raised in sort of the last gasp of Christendom. I was raised in a small town in which everybody kind of worked together and helped raise each other's kids, and we were farmers and all that. And now, uh, and to be a priest was a thing of honor. And all of a sudden, that 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 shifted for us. Um, and uh, and so to be ordained in that year was really really kind of an excruciating but a joyful experience because uh, the martyr's mindset is something that it, it's important for us to recognize that that's always been the highest honor for Christians. We, we, we've forgotten about that because we're so far away from the first ages of the Church. But when we look there, if you, if you talk about the vocation of the laity, and of course the Second Vatican Council uh, very, very intently tries to recover a sense of the sanctity of the laity and the universal call to holiness, and that's particularly for this age. Because uh, in a time when the priesthood, for instance, becomes less recognized as a, uh, as a, as, as a position of honor, as an educated, uh, sort of respected um, uh, position in, in civil life, uh, then the work of the laity becomes all the more important, because the lay people are the people who are out in the trenches, on the front lines, in the kind of contact with other people in which evangelization can really happen. And that means that it's not negotiable that lay people need concretely to be trained in evangelization, need to know how to share their faith, and need to have a sense for the urgency behind it. Again, um, we can't give in to cowardice in this respect. We have to be bold in the proclamation of the faith. Yeah, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be to be all in. I just don't think there's going to be room. I, I think this is part of it. I just said this in my own mind for a while and with, with friends, and your book kind of just says it out loud, which is there's just not going to be room for quiet for lukewarm Catholicism. It's going to be a thing of the past um, because no one, right. wants to be, no one wants to be a part of that. Well, it— and lukewarm Catholicism doesn't work in our time, and we see it. You know, we don't have to look very far to see what the collapse looks like when the Church continues in a Christendom mode when the ground has shifted and things have become apostolic. And so look, for instance, at some of the most Catholic societies in the world a handful of generations ago. Think about Belgium and Spain and Ireland and Quebec. These are places which were some of the most Catholic places in the world. Go to them today, and they're some of the most secular places in the world. Some of the most aggressive abortion and euthanasia policies are in those places, in places which used to be thickly Catholic. And that's because the Church was going along in business-as-usual mode uh, and didn't have that apostolic spirit. That could happen to us, too. It hasn't yet in that same way, uh, because I think that there... There is, in the American spirit, 
Uh, and because we've always been kind of, in a certain sense, strangers in a strange land. You know what I mean? The United States has never been a Catholic country, although it certainly has had a Christian ethos about it. Catholics, I think, in our country uh, are better prepared than maybe anywhere else in the world to live in this apostolic mindset. But we have to be intentional about it. It won't happen automatically. You, you mentioned the book, how people... Um, I, I'm going to miss the exact quote, but about how people want to see your example. Uh, they'd rather be, they'd rather not learn from a teacher. They want to learn from someone they want to follow um, through their sure, example. That's, I think. That's, yeah. I'm trying to, who, yeah. Who are you it's, quoting? It's Saint Paul the Sixth old quote about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that's what we're going to see more and more of is we need to have actual witnesses to the gospel in the way that they act, not in what they say. And it's interesting, as I look at my own life, you talk about the shifting uh, in just a few generations. My mother w- went to Catholic school and was taught by priests and nuns in the must have been grade school in the 50s and 60s. And she then, you know, 25 years later, sends her kids to Catholic school and we're taught by lay people who aren't even catechized. And she then wonders, you know, why, how come my kids don't have the same faith that I did or my generation did? And it's like, well, the, the groundwork shifted pretty quickly there, right? That yeah. all, the, all of a sudden you can't just send your kids to any school you want. You've got to be way more, um, you know, thoughtful in how we do this. And it becomes more incumbent upon us as parents because, as you mentioned, you know, they used to be able to throw them in the stream and the stream was Catholic. And everything in society would point towards this, uh, the, the river was all Catholic, is all Christian. And now that's just not the case. If you throw them in the river, well, we're going against the stream right now. And we've got to be able to go against the tide. And I think, again, this book, that's kind of a little microcosm of my own life seeing this. But again, the book really explains that. Well, what's wonderful, it's important for us to remember, you used the word witness, quoting uh, St. Paul the Sixth and his famous quote about how people aren't looking for teachers they're looking for witnesses, and if they believe teachers, it's because those teachers are witnesses. The word witness means martyr, uh, and so it's important for us to witness. And in terms of lay people who are raising families, absolutely, Joe. I would say this. Going around and talking about this book, the most emotion that I've ever met with it, and this has happened time and time and time again, long before the book was even in print, I would give talks about this. In fact, I gave a talk in Des Moines about it one time to the Knights and Ladies of the Holy Sepulcher when they met there. Um, And uh, in fact, at that very talk in Iowa, uh, people came up to me, and this is one thing that I've heard many times, and they said, you've touched upon our deepest grief, and that's this. You know, we raised our kids just the way that we were raised. We sent them to Catholic school. We made sure that they had their sacraments. We taught them the, the the stories of the Bible. We prayed the rosary. We did everything that our parents did, and it worked for us. We have the faith, but our children don't, and our grandchildren, some of them aren't even baptized, and people will begin to sob as a result of, of that, so gripped with guilt. And, uh, of course, what they weren't acknowledging and what the the book helps them to see is that the ground was shifting under their feet. Their parents had a whole lot of help in the ambient um, sort of uh, atmosphere of the society in which they were raising their children. They didn't have that benefit. And now people like you, Joe, who are raising your children today don't have to make and and shouldn't make that same mistake uh, because you see clearly uh, that there is secular culture, secular forces on the move in our culture, that children need to be not just protected from, but fortified for. Our children need to be taught how to be apostles from the earliest age. We, and my listeners have heard me say this, we tell the, every day we're telling the, our children the lives of the saints. And I used to think yes. I used yes. to think that these lies of the saints that we're reading, especially with the recent martyrs, whether it's the Cristeros or or, or ones in, mm-hmm. the, in the Nazi times, you know, we I used to think there were stories in, in galaxies far, far away. No, 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 they're coming to us, and we want to make sure our children are prepared for it. So. My senior say, I, I could do this for another five hours, but unfortunately, the radio makes us take breaks, uh, and we have to end this interview. The book is From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, Pastoral Strategies for an Apostolic Age. Monsignor Shea, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. It's a joy to be with you. God bless you, Joe, and all your listeners. Thanks so much. We're going to head to a short break, and we will be right back. 
Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the morning is provided by Five Sons Naturescapes. Five Sons Naturescapes is a Catholic veteran-owned family company providing premium outdoor landscaping. Clean up and restore outdoor living space with retaining walls, privacy fencing, pergolas, paver sidewalks, and patios. Issues with soil settling and water around the foundation and yard? Five Sons Naturescapes can grade and install drainage tile to help. Five Sons Naturescapes online at fivesonsnaturescapes.com. My help comes from you. You're right here, Gordon. Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Monsignor James Shea. What a what a privilege that was for me to be able to interview him. Again, I think he's one of the great minds in the church today. He's so articulate in the faith. And this book, uh this book is it's incredible. And it really it's again it's ninety some pages. You know, it's it's a quick read. But it's extraordinarily concise and well thought out in how we need to live today, how the culture has shifted so much in the last, well, 50, 60, 90 years. And it's hard to it's hard to miss it. It's hard, I mean, it's hard to see it, but it's impossible to miss it. And so how do we then change our game plan? How can we as parishes, how can we as individuals, as families, how can we change our game plan in order to live in this new world, uh, one that is no longer a, a Christian culture? Uh, we have to, we have to act more like the early apostles, and that's why. What a wonderful time to have this interview! What a great time to have Tim Jamison speaking at the men's conference last week, or you know, and, and to to understand we're in Pentecost, right? So this is we just had the, the the feast of Pentecost. This is the time we are now in a period of apostolic mission, and this book. From Christendom to Apostolic Mission will help you to see through the eyes of the apostles, to see what they did and how they did it, uh, and how that our culture is not much more different than theirs was, and our mission is the same as theirs. Thanks again for joining me today on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulus. It's time to man up. Man Up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulis. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.